Um, so welcome to Joyful Sober. I'm Alison Lassick and today I'm chatting with much loved Australian artist, writer and broadcaster Ty Snaith. Um, but first, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands where, we're, where we are recording this conversation today, the Boon Wurrung and the Wiradjuri people of the Kulin Nation. And I'd like to pay my deepest respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who might be tuning into our chat. Um, yeah, so it's great to have you on the line today. Ty um, Snaith is a storyteller and this quality permeates through her broad and generous practice. Um, in addition to making beautiful paintings and ceramics, a large part of Ty's work is dedicated to the community surrounding contemporary art. So Ty hosts a regular review of visual art on Triple R, which is a radio station here in Melbourne. She hosts a podcast, A World of One's Own, where she chats to other inspiring female artists. And she's also an active board member of C3 Contemporary Art Space. Um, she's written and illustrated six picture books um, that are published with Tame and Hudson. How are you going, Ty? I'm good, thanks, Alison. It's always hard to endure your own bio. <laughs> But thank you. That was a nice introduction. I'm Ple very happy to be here. Pleasure. Um, cool. So to kick us off, I was wondering if you would be happy to tell us a little bit about your sober journey. So when roughly you stopped drinking and how it's been going at your end? Yeah, it, it's been, well, first of all, it's been going well, really well. Um, it, I know exactly when it began. Uh, it was the 1st of February was my first day without alcohol. Um, because the 31st of January was bad and it was the last bad that I ever wanted to have and I guess I just thought this is ridiculous, I don't need to do this anymore and I thought I'll just give it a go, see how many days I can go in a row or really it was just a bit like, it was a bit like an experiment at the beginning and um, yeah, so what's that, nearly, I don't know, seven, seven. months? Yeah. Yeah, nearly eight months, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. I haven't been. It's funny, though. I'm not really a counter. I know when it began, but I'm not like, oh, I'm up to 95.6 days, which I get some people are, but I'm not. I feel like sometimes if I put too much of a, like, um, pressure on something, then I'm more likely to break it, whereas if it just becomes um, my life, then yeah. why I count? Like, I don't count how many days I've had a shower. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. And you know the date so you can celebrate your anniversary next year if that's you want right. or yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's about a month longer than me and I'm not counting mine exactly either. But um, yeah, it's when just, it starts. Yeah. Yeah, exactly right. You can sort of remember though that first day and first week. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I'm happy to share. I, I was at a really big party and I um, ended up Ah, uh, you know, like taking off lots of my clothes, which I mean is fine, it's fine, but it just wasn't really what I wanted to be doing. And I had a huge argument, public argument with my partner, and then I like abused the taxi driver. And I got home and I just thought, this is not cool. Like the the whole reason I did all three of those things that I'm not proud of is because I just had too much to drink. So you know, I'm not stupid. So in my life, I tend to sort of look at things as they happen and weigh up where it's gone well or where it's not gone so well. And I generally across the board make really informed decisions about the way I live my life in every other respect. And yet I'd sort of let this one slip through the net so many times and, you know, lost friends or lost, I don't know, burnt bridges. And I, I, I just couldn't ignore it anymore, basically. Yeah, yep, that's so super mature. Like when, because I suppose alcohol, it's got its plus sides as well, or it's imagined um, benefits to your life that is why we kind of all continue. But then to sort of rationally be able to weigh all of that up is pretty huge, actually. Yeah, I think it is that it's just sort of rationally, it's more taking responsibility for me. And it's been in line with a lot of other changes that I've made about myself. And a lot of them were difficult too, but basically they came through lots of counselling and therapy and really just owning up to things that I do um, on a regular basis that I wasn't happy with. And it's funny, like I'm a complete control freak with my work, so I can look at something I've made and be able to go, oh, that's successful in this way or, you know, not successful in another way. Or I can talk about other people's works. I'm quite articulate and critical 
um, and constructively critical. So I just got to the point, I think, where I, I needed to be constructively critical about myself and not to make it like a negative thing where I was hating on myself because I found that part of my journey was really about being kind to myself. And one of the things I was doing with drinking was just, um, you know, using it as a way to beat myself up. Mm. And every time I was either like I'd been drunk or done something I regretted or had a bad hangover or whatever or looked terrible or I was bloated, I would just beat myself up about it. Like it's your fault, you're an idiot, whatever. And by taking it out of the equation, I didn't have that reason to be mean to myself. So I've really noticed a big impact in terms of my self-worth and confidence, yeah. Yeah, amazing. Um, yeah, you should be really proud. You don't have that reason anymore. <laughs> well, you know, I don't feel like it's an achievement. It's a weird thing. And I, I remember hearing someone else say this um, on one of the audiobooks I listened to. It's not like it's not like this big achievement that I want praise for or anything. I actually feel like I've made my life easier. Like it's not been hard. It's actually made my life easier. Yeah, and that's amazing. the irony, I think, of the whole situation. It's like, oh, my God, my body's happy because it's easier for my body not to have to process, you know, toxins. But the thing is, I guess, that our brains enjoy that process because it lets you be a little bit outside of yourself. Like it, it, it turns your thinking brain off. But I think I just got to the point where I was like, I like my thinking brain, you know. I've spent years getting my thinking brain to be what I want it to be. So why am I, like, why am I, you know, tainting that or mm. wanting to turn it off? Why can't I just help my thinking brain be less inhibited or, you know, um, be able to talk to strangers, which I can do anyway. So for me it was just a bit like why am I even doing this? Why yeah, I- yeah, <laughs> when you can't really see the point of it necessarily anymore. Yeah, and do- bad things, yeah. Do you find that there's other um, ways or things that you do to relax or to kind of s- find that um, way to switch off the thinking brain, I guess, to wind down in the evenings or, you know, at the that's, times you need to? That's the hardest bit, I think, is that um, at the start I really tested lots of different things out. So for me, like having a bath was a big one. And in the first few months I had heaps of baths. And it probably helped that we were sort of in and out of lockdown because I wasn't, I'm pretty social, so I wasn't out as much. And I feel like that's helped me quite a lot is to not, to just have less of those opportunities where someone puts it in your hand or you're at an opening and it's on a tray because I'm pretty impulsive. So, um, you know, that would be hard, I think, at the start. But now that I'm, um, I know how to satiate myself in other ways. So, yeah, like relaxing was hard. So I found the best things for me were, having a bath and having a ritual around it because I realised that the actual part of drinking that I like the most is the ritual around it, like the opening a bottle of wine or like having a nice glass or those kinds of things Um, or even like mixing a cocktail or whatever. It's the sort of magic of it. It's not actually the thing. Mm. So I started to sort of break that down and think, okay, well, what else? I can still give myself that ritual. So I found this amazing beetroot juice that everyone always laughs at me, but it's like, it's so good. And I just, it's expensive, which somehow sort of, you know, helps because it's special. And um, I would just chill it and have it in a wine glass. Just to begin with, it was quite important to just sort of, I guess I was just transitioning to a different thing in the glass. And you know, the the thing is, I actually like it better. Mm. Wine like it. It's really thirst quenching. It's really substantial. Um, so yeah, I guess they were they were the two things I used. But the, the the switching off is hard. Like, I think the best thing I found for that at the beginning was exercise. So, and luckily it was over summer at the start. So I just did this. Um, it was quite intuitive. I just would when I would have a drink normally. So sort of like um, just before dinner. You know, if you're cooking dinner or whatever, that it's like the end of the day thing is the hardest bit for me or was. It's not now, but it was the hardest bit. I would go for a run, which I'm not really a runner either, so it was quite different for me. And I made a really amazing playlist, like just with really up music that I would listen to each time. And I think what was quite important was the listening to the same playlist each time, which sounds really boring. But it's funny because now I hear those songs, I'm really... um it triggers some quite optimistic thing in me and it's quite powerful. So in the same way that I think having a glass of wine maybe triggered my brain to switch off or like that's the end of the working day, 
the having the run with the music, it transitioned me into this other way of switching off. So your body sort of, you know, goes through a transformation, it uses energy or whatever. But then also it's made me switch into this positive mind frame. And what I think I was doing with the wine is, yes, it was sort of marking the end of the day, but instead of making me positive, it actually switched me into kind of like a quite negative um, mind frame. So I would get like quite critical of the news or like, you know, someone on the TV I'd get quite critical of or I'd have an argument with my partner and it that became part of my drinking routine. And so I think for me like switching off in a positive way has mm. been really useful and it's completely changed my relationship with my partner and my kids and everything. I can yeah. imagine that's completely different if they're probably seeing a different you showing up in the evenings. Definitely, yeah, like I'm nice. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's so good. And do you feel like you've got more energy as well? Um, like, do you, you know, for your relationships and for your work and just in general? I think not so much more energy. Like, I don't think, I don't think I uncovered some amazing reserve of energy. That would be cool. But no, I think it's different energy. I mm. think that's and that maybe maybe people think that's more energy because it's it's more positive energy. So I found that. I can also be um, like if something's going well, I'm really amazing at keeping positive stuff going well. Like I get on a flow or, you know, like chain of events and everyone around me gets involved and I'm very positive. But if I get into a negative mind frame, I'm also really destructive. So it's like I have both extremes. Mm. And I found that for me, just doing a lot of therapy and talking with my counsellor about when these negative spirals happen and then really just unpicking them right back to the beginning of when that first thing happened it was always alcohol always every yeah, single wow. time so whether it was alcohol in the moment like that night or the night before or a week before i could basically pick back this chain of events of the spiral and it began with that sort of it, it's a depressant you know and i think it just triggered something in me that it's not worth it for me like it's fun in the moment and sometimes it tastes good. But now that I'm not drinking it, I'm like, I don't think it even tasted that good. Like, I think it was more just a pattern, a habit of, yeah. And, and the relaxing was a big thing. But for me, it also triggered this chain of events. And for me to know that and to actually understand that was a really pivotal, yeah, point. Yeah, that's so powerful. Is that your biggest sort of why? Like the thing that keeps you motivated along the way, knowing that? Yeah, I think my biggest why is just that I am a better person, like I'm a nicer person to be around and I my family means a lot to me and my work means a lot to me um, and my friendships. And they were the three things that suffer most when I'm drinking. And even if it's not a lot of drinking, even if it's just a little bit, uh, that negativity that it does to my brain, and it doesn't, I get that it doesn't do it to everyone's brain, but for me it does. Um, and that that start of a negative mind frame affects those three things that are really important to me. And I guess I just kind of went, well, they're more important to me. You know, my relationship's more important to me than having a nice glass of wine. Like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Especially if you can still have that ritual and yeah. yeah. I'm really curious about your beetroot juice. I definitely want to get onto that. <laughs> really good. It's called beat it, like B double T no B double E T it, beat it, which I thought was funny because it did help me beat it. But I, I think you're right, like treating myself was it was really interesting. I clearly remember part of that first couple of months where I thought a, a lot about the language that I use around alcohol. And that's something that's like, you know, from your parents even. It's not just something from, you know, at people around you. But, uh, you know, for as long as I can remember, my mum would, you know, um, she deserved a glass of wine in the evening. And the more I thought about that, I was like, that's, a, that's actually really sort of saddest or something because I don't deserve a glass of toxic shit. <laughs> I deserve something nice in my body. What 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 the hell is this language we use around this? Like, fair enough if you want to drink that, that's cool, but you don't deserve it. Mm. You know, this isn't a treat. This is like a big job for your body to process. And I'm getting old and I don't think my body wants to do that anymore. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like it's yeah. giving these signs that this isn't actually nice when it goes into my body and my liver. So maybe I do need to treat myself properly, like have a bath do a face mask, drink some beetroot juice. And it was amazing because 
once I turned the language around a little bit, um, my body started to really just feel different, like quite different, like it was thanking me or something. Mm, yeah, yeah. I'm curious about that. Like, do you yeah. feel as though you notice a difference physically? And I definitely notice the difference. Like, I noticed it in my eyes and my all the ba- the things that everyone says, like my skin, my eyes. I lost weight straight away. Um, I felt like I felt stronger, so less. Um, what's the word? It's like less sort of puffy and mm. bloated and um, rashy. I used to always get this weird rash on my chest and I don't get it anymore. Um, yeah, but it's interesting. I did get other weird side effects. Like since I've quit drinking, I have had, it's almost like my body was so accustomed to it. Uh, it was part of my digestive system was to drink. And so since taking that out, I have had a few other issues with digestion and stuff but I think that's kind of normal it's like readjusting to not having the acid and the alcohol in there so you know I've had to change a few little things um but yeah it's yeah you notice it I definitely noticed it yeah 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 I definitely noticed some changes in my digestion at the start probably just for the first few months but it Mm -hmm. it kind of goes normal after a while or at least for me it did yeah yeah, and I found it's less um, less irritable. I used to get really bad sort of irritable bowel and stuff because you'd have a big night drinking and it'd just kill all your gut flora. And then the next day you're like, oh, shit, I have to have some yogurt. And, you know, you, like it's just a, like a holocaust in your stomach every time you have a big night. It's kind of crazy. So I don't miss that. Actually, don't miss. I don't miss any of the associated side effects with alcohol. Really. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> so, like, I miss the feeling when you get a little bit tipsy, quite like that. I used to like that, but it doesn't last long and you usually go too far. Like who stops at a bit tipsy? No one. Yeah, yeah it's true. You start, because you start <laughs> feeling rubbish when it wears off. So it's hard to find that sort of perfect balance. Yeah. And the one yeah. thing I try and remind myself is I really don't miss the way that I was when I was tipsy. I used to just talk absolute shit or like try and you know, just dumb things like try and make people laugh or gossip. That's a big thing, massive thing. I used to gossip when I was drunk and now I just don't, I stop myself because I think, oh, I don't need to say that. And so, but I never used to have that filter because I was drunk. So, yeah. That's, that's super big, positive as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> massive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, person. yeah amazing yeah. for me things like gut health I didn't really know or didn't think about it when I was drinking but it's interesting when you stop you know you can start to investigate all of these um health benefits from mm. not drinking but I never probably I probably chose not to look into it in the past yeah. while I was drinking <laughs> for some unknown reason <laughs> well I think part of, the, part of the time is because I mean it's the same when you do any kind of looking at yourself in a real way sometimes you don't want to see that stuff like Mm. sometimes well but if i see that stuff then i have to stop drinking so you don't see the stuff i mean it's like humans and climate change it's like some of us see it because we know we have to see it but there's a whole lot of people that are in denial and it's the same with what we put into our body i mean i really also should quit sugar and i should quit meat but i think it's a gradual process and for me it was starting with therapy and starting with some of like my language and other things I did and then when I put the puzzle together a bit more I'm like ah oh, well yeah drinking clicks into that negative those negative patterns that I have and so and things like exercise I've definitely started doing a lot more exercise and focused things that make me feel good and make my body stronger so I think it is for me it's been doing it in conjunction it was quite important because it made me see it across a spectrum of you know improvements I was doing to myself like like renovations or something yeah Yeah. amazing (laughs) yeah I kind of saw it a a little bit like decluttering like I got really crazy into Mari Kondo and just trying to (laughs) eliminate all these things from my life that weren't really needed or weren't bringing joy but then it took so long to like pull back those layers to get to the point where you know ready to look at alcohol in that same critical eye yeah, I think that's it. It's that's the that's the point is like being able to be honest with yourself that that's not what I don't it's not good for me. Like it's not not what I like. Mm. So and also just being able to decipher what you do like, you know? Like we're so we're told so often like our whole childhood that getting drunk is fun and you know, we see our parents do it and then we do it when we're a teenager and we remember those formative times that we had when we were drunk. But you know, no one ever sort of says but you would have had those formative times anyway, even if you weren't drunk. But I think our brains, for whatever reason, because they're programmed like they are, 
remember the alcohol and so mm. and then it's there and everyone else does it and so yeah yeah and, and I do yeah sorry oh sorry I was I was just gonna ask I guess in those times those formative moments it starts becoming almost like a part of your identity in a way so then it's yeah. like when you stop you have to kind of go through this whole new process of redefining what that looks like or what who you are and what life looks like without alcohol would you That's agree right. yeah yeah I definitely agree and I found that just not for long but I found it quite confronting because I'm very extroverted so I love going out staying out late and I love dancing and I sort of thought shit like maybe I won't be able to be that person anymore but then when I tested it out, actually what I found was I'm still fine to go out and have conversations and dance. And even with drunk people, I don't care. Like it's it's alarming, but <laughs> funny, you know. But what I found was the first party I went to, um, uh, just everyone wanted to go to a second place, right? And everyone's like, oh, we'll have to get six Ubers and you know, and I said, well, no, because I can drive everyone. And everyone was like, you can't drive. And I said, yeah, because I, I don't, you know, I haven't had any alcohol. And they were like, what? And it was just sort of like this revelation where I went, actually love being able to be, even though I can still be at a party and have fun, I love being able to be able to drive myself at any moment and leave and help other people. I love the thought that if something happened, I could deal with it like I could mm. bandage someone or I could give them you know resuscitate someone or I hate the thought that I would be so drunk in that moment to not be of any use so for me like that feeling of being useful and in control way outpowers the feeling of being drunk and in the moment you know you can mm. still be in the moment but be like useful and in control but I think for me it was like not not putting the brand of like a nana or whatever over myself and just letting myself be myself and I'm still the same like it doesn't change me not drinking and so that once I got through that part um and pushed myself out a few times and just had really fun nights then I realized it wasn't actually about the alcohol that makes the fun night it's actually about just talking and dancing and you know staying awake yeah yeah and of course that makes you your self-esteem and your own confidence go up because you realize that all of that cool and fun stuff was you all along yeah exactly and I think it yeah it's really reassuring because you go oh that's yeah that's in me I don't need this substance to make me what I thought I was um the only thing I think people you know is hard is that other people's perception of you changes so I found that my way of dealing with that was just to talk to people about it because I feel like, um, you know, I think it's hard when people decide to be sober and then they just go, oh, but that's my thing. Anyway, you know, like, don't ask me about it. I don't want to talk about it because I felt the opposite. I felt really like I wanted to talk about it and at the risk of maybe being ranty or preachy. And I did say to everyone I spoke to, I'm like, if you don't want to hear this or if it's annoying or boring or whatever I can shut up but most people I was really surprised were like no no I really want to hear this and I'm a talker and a storyteller so I thought it was quite important to to keep telling that story to people and I think through telling that um I really believed it as well and like the more I tell a story the more I understand the nuances within it and see different things that I'm saying and and then it's like writing your script you know Mm. So, and I found that along the way a few people have been inspired by that and have stopped drinking or even on social media I did post a few things not you know just in my stories but um just because that's what I'm going through like I found a good mocktail that tastes good this is how I made it and amazingly so many people responded positively in that they wanted to try it too so like yeah it did make me think oh, I'm not alone and actually maybe people do want to hear this Maybe they don't. I don't know. Maybe I've lost friends, but I haven't noticed that. So yeah, I think um, I've like made friends, like yeah. made friends, other friends that that get it or that have either tried it or that are that admire it. And usually they're really strong, interesting people. So I guess part of me is like, do I want my friends going forward that I make new friends to be addictive booze hounds, or do I want my new friends to be strong interesting people that think critically about their life and the world around them so yeah, yeah. amazing you don't need those other people yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah changes the way you connect or what you're what you're looking for potentially in those yeah. in those friends it's quite amazing um 
Yeah, interesting. And then I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your art practice right now, like what you what you're working on, and if it um, if you're feeling like being sober throughout making changes, anything at all. Um, I think I'm working on a number of different things at the moment. I'll probably take another hour to explain all. Of them. <laughs> I'm working on about We've got four time, projects, but mainly. Um, a new series of picture books which are really involved, like quite research heavy, but then really um, like take me a million hours. I was going to show you something, but they're sort of out of reach. But yeah, like creating uh, all the animals in the world. So it's called Wonders Under the Sun. And they're all the animals that I find inspiring that come out during the day. But then I've grouped them into different groups that I've made up. So not scientific groups. So, for example, there's like swingers and clingers is a group. So amazing. Swing and cling. But also they've got little jokes for the parents because, you know, that's sort of funny in terms of partners, swingers and clingers. And then there's like spotted bottoms and homebodies. And so it's basically me just drawing attention to all these. And a lot of the animals are quite rare and unusual. And then it's sort of packaged in a way that it's uh, I write an introduction and a conclusion of what kids can do to help um, these animals to survive because a lot of them are critically endangered or on the verge like most animals on the earth and um, so there's you know the ulterior motive is just to kind of inspire kids to maybe use their creativity to bring attention to creatures and their habitat and then that brings protection and um, engagement you know like I think the best activism is always when you actually just like something. So, you know, like people yeah. want to go and spend time in the Tarkine and then people know about the Tarkine and then it doesn't get fucked over. So so that's the theory behind the book and there's four in the series. So there's like 16 groups of animals and about 30 animals in each group. So I'm working on that. Beautiful. And that has to be finished by October. And then I also am working on a series of uh, ceramic vessels that are sort of quite dark. They're black vessels. And they're going to be in a show I'm having at Heidi in um, Heidi Museum of Modern Art in November. So that's um, underway. And I've also made, oh, I can reach this. I've made these miniature wearable vessels as well. So you can put like a tiny stem in it. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. So I had the originals uh, 3D scanned and then printed in steel. So that's the first time I've ever done something like that. That's quite cool because it's almost like a talisman or like a wearable, um, you know, hope mm. that you can put hope in. So that's another project. And then I'm also working on um, a commission for an art museum in Prague, which is a series of sort of images of open books with objects that I've made on top that are around the founding myths of the city of Prague, which is super fun and amazing because it's the other side of the world and it's giving me a bit of hope that maybe we, I don't know, we'll be yeah, out of visit. this situation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Or just, I don't know, that it exists, that Europe still exists. So, so I'm working on that too and they're all sort of concurrent projects. But part of, I think, linking it back to your question was how has it influenced my practice? Um, one thing that I noticed really substantially, like markedly noticed, I back myself more now mm. that I'm sober. So I feel like it's sort of what I was saying before with the negative thoughts is that when I had more negative thoughts, I often second guess myself or say, oh, no, no, like that's not for you. You're not good enough to apply for that. Or you couldn't approach the director of Heidi. You know, that's not for you because I'm not, you know, 100% behind myself or um, or I was a bit hungover on Monday morning so I didn't have enough energy to write an email. Whereas now I get up on Monday morning and I'm like, right, you know, start of the week, let's go. And now, you know, this morning I got up and got up at quarter to six and then I went to my personal trainer at seven. I was like, who the fuck are you? What the hell is this? <laughs> <laughs> Things like that where I think I've yeah. got more hours of the day. And so, yeah, I'm getting heaps more work done. And just little things like I probably in the past would have, you know, been offered this book contract and gone, oh, ugh, I can't do that, you know, or this is too much for me or I'm not good enough for that. And now I'm just like, yeah, it's going to be hard, but I can do it and I can do this many a day and that's it. Like I, I don't have to factor in two or three hours a week that I'm hungover, you know. I don't have, and, and often the hard thing I reckon when I was drinking is you don't know when they'll be either like 
it's not always Sunday morning. You know, you might have a Zoom thing and drink two bottles of wine and then Wednesday morning you're a mess. And that's not good. Like that uncertainty for me was not good because I could never be, I could never sort of know that I was going to be able to do a job or finish a painting or, and when I'm hungover, I don't make very good work. Like I know that there's the all the like, you know, Hunter S. Thompsons and whatever that think it inspires their, but it's bullshit. And surprise, surprise, they're all men. You mm. know? It's a, just an excuse. The drunk painter thing is just a fallacy for me anyway. I don't, I mean, the work I make when I'm, you know, inebriated is not great. You think it's great when you're doing it, but it's not great. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's influenced my work in a million ways. Yeah, I make more of it. I have more time. It's I like it when I make it rather than thinking I'm shit all the time. Yeah, Amazing. It just changes <laughs> it, doesn't it, the whole experience of being a maker. And it's amazing how you can look back and go, oh, my God, I got all these amazing, like the projects I'm working on at the moment are amazing. And if someone had told me, two years ago, this is what you'll be working on during a pandemic in 2021, I would have been like, no fucking way. I couldn't do those four things at once. But it's amazing how quickly the positive momentum builds up. And I read somewhere that when you make a positive, clear decision, there's things in our brain, like uh, chemicals that are released in our brain that just solidify that process. So your brain likes it when you make a clear decision, right? And then it can make more clear decisions. Whereas when you make an unclear decision like, oh, maybe I won't drink tonight or maybe I will or, you know, your brain's like, oh, well, fucking hurry up and decide. <laughs> and it burns all this weird energy doing that. Whereas when you go, no, I don't drink. Like now I just say I don't drink and no one asks you again. It's awesome. Yeah. And your brain goes, oh, I've got space to think about who I'm going to talk to instead or, you know, like how I'm going to move my body in a coordinated manner. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true isn't it that like decision fatigue that from trying to moderate like just the idea of trying to say oh I'm only having one drink when I go out with friends like that just seems exhausting and like it's it exhausting. lasts about two seconds <laughs> and also then everyone sees that as some kind of weird challenge to make you have another drink whereas when you say no I'm not drinking and I'm driving everyone home everyone's like yeah fuck yeah awesome she's driving us home right yeah and they drink you know and I it's think, made it such a positive thing as well that no one's exactly. going to question it when they can see how much you're getting it back from from those decisions yeah and I found that my closest friends were really impressed like they said like some of my close friends were like well that's a big thing they try not to make a big thing out of it but they were like that's you know that's awesome and then some of the intermediary friends which I obviously didn't need much were like oh, why would you make that decision? I need you to drink with me. You know, there's that as well. And then people like my partner, it was really interesting because I was really worried because I know it's difficult for one person to be sober and the other person not to be sober. But he was really, I think he was just curious about how positive it had been for me. So he was like, wow, he, he just said, I can notice it so distinctively. And so then he was jealous. And so he did. <laughs> oh, wow, that's amazing. Yeah, so he sort of stopped for, for a few months with no alcohol and now he's gone back to just having a tiny bit. And it's funny, I think a few nights he's tried to push himself to have like a whole bottle of wine and he just doesn't want it. Like it's it's funny how once you get back to zero, you really don't, it, you don't have the capacity to go, you know, we build up resilience for sure. Mm. To alcohol, so, yeah. I yeah. What the question was now. That's all right. It was a great chat. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because your body kind of normalizes it. And when you're drinking a lot, it sort of becomes just your your status right. status normal that um, it's better to have your status normal at the healthy level, probably. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. And, and I mean, it's hard, though, when you want to push yourself um, above normal, like I've found that that's the that's the trickiest thing for me, I tend to eat lots of sugar instead which isn't great, but I think you've gradually got to work out how to do that without a substance. And, you know, there are lots of other ways to increase your serotonin and whatever. And I've found that I've been reading a lot more, which is really interesting. Um, and I think my brain is probably seeking other um, stimulation. Like it's looking for a way to be excited, which is great because it means you're sort of getting excited still. Like I still have this other, this urge to be above normal yeah like, just got to learn how to do it without that you know chemical whatever 
Yeah. But I have noticed that sex is so much better. I don't know if you've noticed this. Yeah, I that. <laughs> Whoa, this is so much better because you get, it's not like it's not dulled and it's just much more sort of like you're aware of everything. It's good. So yeah. that was, that's a massive bonus. Yeah, all those sensory, you know, your body looking for that excitement can definitely find it there for sure. Like you can feel yeah. everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. So much better. And it's not that sort of weird anxiety you get when you're a little bit drunk and things aren't working properly and then everything spirals into, oh, it's my fault, whatever. You just assess things a little bit more clear headedly and know what you want and how to get it. Yeah. Yeah. No. Amazing. Def- what a win. <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah so good and and the other thing I've noticed just recently and I don't know whether it's a time thing having done it for this long like you know nearly eight months or whatever is just now every time a present a moment presents itself where I would have a drink I've started doing this thing where I think about it because I've not like promised that I'm never going to drink again ever and I didn't ever make that promise but every time the the possibility comes up I just kind of go why would I do it now like mm. why would I have this drink and not like yesterday or and I can never come up with a good enough reason so I just don't have it you know yeah it's really interesting um and also if you have this drink why wouldn't you have the next one in a way so it's like I don't know that's for me I think I could moderate but that would be kind of hard and this is feeling really good <laughs> exactly and I, I don't know that I believe you can moderate like I just don't know that that's a thing for me um I feel like it's kind of all or nothing so and maybe that's a personality thing I don't know but um yeah I feel like once it's on it's it's on like even one glass of wine is not great for me yeah yeah we also relax those um I guess in with your inhibitions is your ability to moderate or we you know once that yeah, prefrontal yeah. cortex is relaxed then it's yeah, very it a whole lot harder yeah. to make those good decisions definitely yep definitely. yeah it's much easier to color outside of the lines yeah yeah and yep. um do you have any hot tips or things that you would want to share with someone who was sort of in the early months or thinking that they might be curious about following a alcohol free path um well i think one of the things i that i found useful and i guess that sort of tipped me over the edge was just to speak to other people that had done it. So if you've got a friend that's recently become sober, and I mean, this is kind of what you're doing, but um, like just have a chat with them and go and talk to them about the benefits that they've found. And it really helped me to speak to people like Veronica Kent, who I know you've spoken to, because I could see it in action. Like I could see that she just all of a sudden bloomed into this really sort of self self not self-centered but like centered person and and very capable and um just i admired her and so part mm-hmm. of me was like made me ask why do i admire her so much and then part a big part of it was that she had the power that she could do that like she had the self-control to do that and she only because she wanted to it wasn't like a doctor had told her and I was really inspired by that so I think for me the biggest tip is just talk to other people that have done it and maybe just see for yourself how it's affected them and then the other thing maybe is to um think about like I was saying before is you don't have to go to therapy but you can sort of do it yourself like just work out all the things in your life that aren't going so well for you like whether it's your relationship or your relationship with your kids or your, you know, money, finances, all those things, like where there's a bit of a blowout or a leak or like explosions, just try and trace back and see, just maybe see if it's involved. Because guess my guess is that at some point you've like got drunk and spent all your money online or you've like got drunk and said something you didn't want to say to your partner and that spurred off some hate and that's never good and it takes a long time to get rid of that sort of nastiness or you've snapped at your kids because you're hungover and you've yelled at them when you probably should have just asked them you know and I think if you can trace that back a bit and just work out if if alcohol wasn't involved then maybe that's not your issue but if it was then just test it out like like anything Mm. it's like the elimination diet when you've got a reaction to a food that's exactly how I thought of it actually it's like you know, I eat cauliflower and I get really bloated. 
And so I just don't eat cauliflower much anymore. And so I worked out, I drink alcohol and I'm turned into a bitch. So I just don't <laughs> drink alcohol anymore. That's so interesting, Ty. I would have never been able to trace that back to me really being like quite snappy at people that I love. Like my mum was a, you know, person that particularly copped it. But then after getting the booze out of my system, I could see that that the way that I handled those conversations was completely different. Like I wasn't showing up with any tension. And so things that she said wouldn't trigger me. And yeah, it's interesting. So yeah, just taking it out and seeing what what occurs is an interesting way as well. Yeah. Yeah. The elimination diet. Yeah. And then, you know, like even if it's the only thing you eliminate, then you might stop at that or you might go on to, you know, I, I know amazing people like, you know, like Missy Higgins is amazing. She's gone on this full journey of, you know, eliminating pretty much everything and she always looks incredible and she's always so sane and you're like, how is she like that? But you can work out how they're like that. They've spent a lot of time thinking about what what happens when you put certain things into your body. Yeah, so, amazing. You know, and I guess, I mean, if you wanted to, you could take it right to like news sources and all sorts of different things. And I think I used to be under the impression when I was younger that everything is best. So like I'd never say no. no. I'd always be like, yes, yes, give it to me. Yes, yes, you know, like multiple partners. Yes, all the drugs, all the alcohol. But I think that there's a point in your life where you go, ah, Maybe not yes to everything. Maybe not yes to every every person or every job even. Or yeah. maybe I do need to choose my, you know, newspapers that I read or the people I follow on social media. There, there are ways to tailor your mental health and your responses as well So and your knowledge and your health. So, yeah, it was just one of those factors for me. I think a lot of people treat alcohol like it's a, like a kind of, big part of their life but when you realize it's not a big it doesn't have to be a big part of your life then it's maybe a bit easier yeah amazing so liberating yeah <laughs> and <laughs> you save so much money yeah <laughs> it cost like 300 dollars to go out for a night it's true uh, the yeah. other thing i did that was great just other tips for people yeah um, I, tr- I i bought myself presents and i know this maybe won't suit everyone but i sort of worked out what it would have cost me for the, I think it was like the first month or two months or something, like what I roughly what I would have spent on alcohol. And it was quite a lot. And so then I thought, well, I can spend a couple of hundred dollars. And I bought this necklace, which they're two little bells. Yeah, beautiful. So when I remember, so when I look at it or I play with it, I just think about how clear as a bell. I Um, love it. And that was just a present to myself. And then I thought, Another time I did this good, it was great actually, where I would have met this girlfriend for a drink and I didn't know her that well and we'd only ever sort of been drunk together at parties or whatever and I thought, what do I do if I'm not drinking? So I just booked the, you know, the day spa sense of self for the for an hour for us and it was it's $60 so it's like, you know, three drinks or whatever. Um, and if, if it's about that, like if it's about money, it, it makes a lot of sense. You sort of go, well, I'd rather sit in a beautiful spa and have like nuts and tea and this lovely environment than just drink three glasses of wine in a bar. You know what I mean? Yeah. And the conversation we had was so much better than if we had been sitting in a bar. So I guess when you start to weigh things up, like I'd rather the nice necklace and a lovely conversation and this sort of intimacy rather than, yeah, just being a trash bag. But yeah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's so good it's so true you get so yeah. many yeah so many benefits from making those switches to more mindful ways of being and spending time yeah, yeah. And, and if you're vain like um I've been <laughs> trying to get my mum to stop drinking not that my mum's vain but you know what I mean like just um say like one thing that helped me was to to look at two people you know that are older and one that stopped drinking when they were younger and one that didn't and just have a think about that yeah wow because there's some people i've met that just progressively drank more and you can definitely see it and you know there are other things that happen you know like cancer yeah <laughs> really want to get cancer. when you see it in front of you like that you're like okay it's better for you <laughs> yeah yeah definitely for the aging process i didn't know that alcohol um stops your collagen production and that kind of thing oh, so yeah that. we'll be less wrinkly when we're old i think that without the booze. Should have stopped it right at the start though that's the 
yeah. But anyway, you can't go back, can you? You can only go forward. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Ty. That was such a good conversation. I really appreciate your time today and all your wisdom. Ah, oh, it, was, it was a joy. It's so nice to talk about it with someone else that gets it. So yeah. hopefully more people can listen and pass it on. It's awesome. Yeah. Pleasure, pleasure.